Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the uh, latest event from the Freeman Air and Space Institute. Uh, today, see it to beat women leading in air and space power. Um, this event is one that I'm very pleased to be able to introduce um, because one of the key things that has occurred to me as we've established the Freeman Institute is that there is sometimes a lack of understanding and awareness of just how many women are making vital and important contributions to the world of air and space power. And the purpose of this event, which is not a pure standalone, but hopefully the first of many, is to showcase a number of the leading lights in air and space power thinking business and practitioners today. Um, we are joined um, by the Chief of the Air Staff, Sir Mike Wigston, and thank you once again, for Mike, for generously providing your time to support the Institute. And Sir Mike, we'll be hearing from him uh, later this afternoon. But I'm also joined, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, by uh, Victoria Foy. Uh, Victoria is a member of the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter Steering Committee. And she's the executive uh, vice president of uh, Safran Seach GB. And today um, she is here um, joining me because the Freeman Air and Space Institute is signing up as a supporting organization to the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter. Uh, in the absence of face-to-face uh, -face contact, there's a slight element of uh, a Blue Peter, here's one we prepared earlier, and uh, we have signed up to the charter. Uh, now, I will hand over, if I may, to you, Victoria, um, if you'd like to start with a few words, but uh, thank you uh, for coming, and thank you, of course, to all our panelists, and once again, to some, some Ike. I would also note, please, just before I hand over to Victoria, I've forgotten one admin point as per usual, um, and that is to note that A, uh, this is being recorded, and secondly, please ask uh, questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat. Um, Victoria, forgive me for my um, slight um, introductory faux pas there, uh, but now over to a few words from you, please. Thank you. No problem, and thank you. David, so um, I'm not sure whether in this virtual world people can see uh, the certificate, but um, hopefully um, you can. And if you can't, well, we'll make sure that it's posted. Um, I want to say a firm congratulations and thank you to uh, the team uh, for joining the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter. Um, really good news for the Charter and I'm sure will be great news for your institute. Um, Maybe just a, a few additional words. Um, actually, this is um, quite a proud moment for me personally. Um, as you said, David, I became a member of the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter Board and Steering Committee um, earlier this year. And I'm the co-lead for the uh, working group, which is committed to um, involving and integrating more signatories. So thank you uh, for being my first signatory. Um, the Women, Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter was founded in 2018 and since that time we have now somewhere in the order of 230 signatories from across the industry and supporting organisations, all with the shared ambition and commitment to have a more gender balanced sector and I guess this is no more true than presently in the wake of the pandemic it's really important that we keep the gender balance in mind as we recover from COVID-19 pandemic. Put very simply, the Charter commits to supporting the progression of women into senior roles within the sector by seeking signatories like yourselves to commit on key targets and to drive change within organisations and in the industry as a whole. In addition, it creates a great opportunity to build networks and learn from best practices, especially those which you'll find if you go onto the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter website, such as the Resource Hub, and also uh, the Corn Ferry Report, which is known as Propelling a Gender Balanced Industry. Before I hand over to Sophie, 
I just want to share a first, uh, a few personal reflections. I was fortunate more than 25 years ago to stumble across another fellow professional who convinced me, who gave me belief that I wanted and I could pursue my ambition to be at that point a chief financial officer in industry and laterly a chief executive officer in industry. And I'm absolutely convinced that by being part of this organization, by being part of the women in aviation and aerospace charter, you too will inspire other young women to pursue their ambitions and to fulfill their ambitions. So I want to say once again, congratulations and thank you for joining the Very charter. Nice. And on that point, I'm gonna hand over to Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Sophie Antropos. I'm a research associate at the Freeman Air and Space Institute. Uh, Victoria, thank you very much for those kind words. And, uh, and I can only reflect equally on how important it is to have people to encourage and mentor you throughout your career. Uh, I, I, before I introduce our fantastic panelists and speakers, each of which will br briefly introduce themselves and tell us a bit about their work, uh, they come from all areas, from academic research, space power, the Royal Air Force and industry. Uh, so a really, really uh, great set of people. Um, I just wanted to remind you that we will have time for questions afterwards. Um, please do use the Q&A rather than the chat function for, uh, for your questions. And please start putting them in as soon as you want to. So yeah, um, questions please in the Q&A area and we'll come on to those in a little while. But without further ado, because it's really about uh, these fabulous uh, women telling you about their work, I'll introduce our first panelist. She's Wing Commander Gemma Austin. She's an RAF doctor and a Chief of the Air Staff Research Fellow in the Department of Aerospace Medicine here at King's College London. Her research examines whether there are any historic inequities within the aerospace medicine field that may be impacting diversity and inclusion within the UK military, aerospace, branches and trades. Gemma's current focus is on the potential challenges of urinating whilst airborne and whether this disproportionately, disproportionately affects and impacts female crew. Her foray into formal research has developed from a wish to answer the question, why aren't more of my aircrew patients female? Gemma, over to you. Sophie, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, Sophie's asked us to talk about sort of what's drawn us into the aerospace world and how we've ended up doing the jobs we're currently doing. So I can't really remember uh, when I was first drawn in because it's always been something I've wanted to do and certainly long before I chose medicine as my career. And 20 years in, it's been a fun journey with wide ranging roles from being a clinical GP as SMO on station through to on ops uh, and as the branch advisor. So no day has been the same, but I've come to formal research sort of really at what will be the midpoint in my career, having been inspired during my diploma in aerospace medicine um, at King's, which advanced the core training that all doctors get um, within the RAF. Um, aerospace medicine focuses on determining and maintaining the health, safety and performance of those involved in aviation and space travel. And a fundamental part of this is physiology and human performance. But during the course, our textbooks and lectures um, barely touched on sex and gender differences. A lot of the empirical studies in aerospace medicine using men to apply to all humans. But over in the sports physiology world, uh, things are changing quite dramatically uh, and they're lifting the lid and examining and harnessing the differences between men and women, sparked really by a disparity in the medal count uh, in Rio. So it got me reflecting on what barriers may exist within my area of interest, um, a similarly demanding profession where physiology, physicality and psychology play a huge part in performance of our aviators. And I felt that I had questions that needed an evidence answer. And the Air Force have really supported me in pursuing this with a full time research position for two terms. Uh, and as Sophie said, this is going to explore a thesis on whether there is potential historical hidden bias within aerospace medicine to my area um, and whether this has got an impact on the diversity within the flying branches and trades. Um, it will surprise none of you that there is no simple answer and certainly the, uh, the, you know, the, the solution doesn't sit purely with aerospace medicine. But I think it's a good time in um, our history within the Air Force to start um, looking deeply at how we all contribute to each other's success. 
um, only a very small percentage of RAF pilots are women and there's no evidence that there's any difference in male and female flying ability, one being better than the other. Um, so we need to understand why we're not doing better at female representation. And over the years, I've recognised the privilege we have as RAF doctors. Um, we get to have conversations with our people that no other leaders can easily do because of the, the nature of the topics. And whilst details are always strictly confidential, themes can be really powerful to amplify quiet voices and, and get sort of unknown um, issues out into the agenda in a, in a sensitive way. And so my focus has fallen on urination behaviours in all aircrew um, as a useful vehicle to demonstrate a range of tangible potential problems that may be disproportionately affecting female aircrew and just aren't get out there in general conversation because of sort of the normal taboo around urination that we have within society. Um, but needing a wee at work is a basic fact of life. And within the airborne workplace, we've got toilets quite literally fit for the queen, right through to standalone devices used in the seat or cabin uh, and the role and function of each of our aircraft it takes what can be used. For women, uh, there are multiple potential additional challenges from flying suit design for male anatomy, the zip just not providing the access needed, uh, to some an open cabin restricting your privacy and sometimes having very limited options like urinal facilities and then trying to integrate, um, integrate menstruation amongst this makes it um, difficult. Um, why this matters in aviation is because of the potential outcomes to flight safety, flight performance uh, and personal health and well-being of any behaviour adaptation that may be chosen to avoid the need to urinate. And if you avoid uh, through deliberate dehydration, um, being dehydrated can reduce your cognitive and physical performance, reduce um, G endurance, increase risk of decompression sickness, hypoxia, bladder health issues like incontinence and UTIs. So you've got flight safety, flight performance and that personal health and well-being just captured there if that's how you choose to do it. Um, if you hold, you risk distraction and uh, impacting your situational awareness. And if you do decide to go, there are sort of some technical um, issues like the need to unstrap or reinsert your injector pin that just may make this a much bigger task than on the ground. Um, but we, at the moment, we've got no empirical evidence as to what the actual prevalence of any behaviour changes is. Uh, and just eye opening anecdotes from both men and women that require some formal probing to really see what the, the nature of any issues are. And just to clearly say this isn't a fast jet problem or a UK only problem. Um, all airborne roles have potential challenges and this is an internationally recognised research gap at the moment. Um, so the formal research project is uh, going through the final stages of ethical approval and, and we should actually have some data to analyse um, over the summer. And that's when my day job will shift to the analysis. Um, but I think what we're going to be able to do is have an understanding more about whether we're supporting a basic human need equitably and whether this could have a positive effect on sustaining and retaining our incredibly valuable air crew and reduce any unnecessary risk or harm to these individuals. We need to understand these potential problems now so they're not carried through into the next generation of Air Force um, people and capabilities. Uh, and, and that's really sort of the passion behind this project and why I'm enjoying so much is it's sort of much more than aerospace medicine, the potential for these answers. Now, Sophie also asked us to discuss role models, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to cop out slightly here and not nominate one person. Um, but my branch grew in support of flying. So we, to start with, had a very similar demographic of Western men initially leading the way. But this has changed dramatically and within the RAF medical services where I sit, um, we're very nearly gender balanced and can really see what we can be. Um, we have two women in two star positions and within just my medical officer peer group, uh, we've got women leading the RAF response to COVID-19, inspiring us as our command flight medical officer, delivering in clinical leadership roles across the NHS and DPHC and even sort of personal staff officers. So I'm sport for choice uh, and accordingly just think, as a branch, we can really role model what can be achieved with um, increasing female representation. So thank you, Sophie, back to you. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, this research is just so interesting. And Gemma and I have had longer chats about it. Um, do, do put in any questions you have because she's got some, uh, you know, really <laughs> fascinating background, but also, yeah, some of the anecdotes we've shared have been interesting. Anyway, moving on, thank you uh, to Julia Baum, our next panelist. Julie is a PhD student here at the Freeman Air and Space Institute. Her research examines the UK's space posture and assesses the UK's approach towards space policy making in the new space age. She holds an MA in Non-Proliferation and International Security from King's College London, as well as an Honours BA in History from the University of Toronto. Julia, 
over to you. Thanks, Sophie. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure and honor to show the panel with such esteemed women, especially as someone who is very much early career. But to just jump right in with a bit of background on myself, I entered the space sector through a very creative start with my childhood and teenage years assuming I'd pursue a ballet career professionally. And when that didn't work out, I switched paths completely in undergrad where I instead focused on uh, Soviet cosmism and manifestations of early space activity through artistic means and continue this research in my master's. So in regards to academia, there really isn't a singular track for anyone. And having a diverse set of knowledge I found has been really quite useful as a researcher applying uh, and approaching any field comprehensively. So when this comes to space, uh, in academia, it's a beautiful and multifaceted field. And I was really drawn to this webbed nature that drives man to space through either logic or passion and what inspires our approaches to space, not only historically or artistically, but ambitiously moving forward. And certainly there's more space for researchers in this area as well. For my PhD in FASI, my research focuses on what it means to thrive in space. And I'm building a strategic theory as a framework for this assessment. This framework is targeted at longevity for a national posture across fluctuating political economic conditions. And I use the case study of the UK to assess its application as well as its utility for space power. As every spacefaring nation has a unique set of needs and goals for space development, I hope this framework will inform a more tailored approach towards national postures. And ultimately, I'm trying to better understand what it means to make ambitions realistic for any space power seeking sustainable development and resilience geared growth over time. So this role consists pretty much of a very diverse schedule day to day. Uh, it depends on the amount of readings I have as well as lectures, conferences, panels, and webinars that I either sign up to attend or speak at. Most recently, I spoke at a CSIS Pony Capstone Conference last week on the modernization program of Putin's hypersonic missiles. Uh, so the fun part about a research career is that you can kind of view it like an octopus in a way, where I have my main body of interest and focus in my PhD, but there's also arms extending outwards into topics that both directly and indirectly correlate to my PhD and to each other. So while I research space power and space strategy, I also extend this research into space policymaking, space security, new age politics, and space weapons, including various other topics to ensure my research is a comprehensive mosaic that reflects this complex orchestra of space today. Moving on to the, the role model that uh, Gemma so uh, kindly noted with her team, uh, I'm gonna recommend Dr. Narmada Goswami. She's an independent scholar from India who co-authored the book, Scramble for Skies, uh, the great power competition to control the resources of outer space in 2020. And she does extensive research on India and China's space programs and strategic cultures. She's also currently working on two books uh, on space power and China's grand strategy. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, but I think she's a fantastic idol to look up to in space scholarship because, well, I think she's brilliant and inspiring, but also because her work on strategic implications is at the nexus of space policy, IR, and grand strategy. So I'll just leave this with saying that the space sector is incredibly welcoming and full of opportunities. There's also plenty of room for more space academics to bridge gaps and develop new research. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, diverse backgrounds and expertise are a massive asset in this field. I'm quite enthusiastic about anyone with star eyes wanting to explore the field of space power and space security through academia. And I look forward to watching this field grow onward and upward. So thank you, and I'll pass it off to the next panelist. Thanks so much, Julia. I absolutely loved your um, description of sort of PhD research as, as being a bit like an octopus. It, it certainly was for me uh, in my journey, and in fact, um, Today, we'll be publishing um, a bit of an article about something I've just co-published with another uh, ex-military veteran scholar, Hannah West, about the deeply old and looking at gender from the perspective of uh, veteran researchers. So uh, all sorts of things come out of PhDs. I, I, I can't recommend enough making the most of all of those opportunities. It's not just writing the thesis, although clearly you need to do that. 
Okay, moving on then. Um, I'm delighted. We, so we've had two very different aspects of air and space power research, I think you'll agree. Um, but keeping a bit on the theme of space, um, I'm delighted to introduce Nicola Bolton. Uh, Nick, Nikki has a master's degree in physics with astrophysics from Manchester University, and she joined the RAF as a weapon system officer on Tornado F3 fast jets. Continuing her specialism in aerospace, she now works for the UK Space Agency, and she's the lead for the Government Satellite Communications. Previous roles she's had have included in international engagement and instigating the forthcoming National Space Strategy. She's a STEM ambassador for the UK Government, and she mentors girls looking to begin a career in science. Over to you. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be with you virtually. Um, yeah, so Nicola Bolton, uh, how did I get into the aerospace sector? Well, it's a bit of a, a bit of a random one. Um, I was born in a very rural part of Ohio in America, uh, and I think there must have been something in the soil because it was about 10 miles away from where Neil Armstrong was born and raised. And I remember my mum saying that I talked about space passionately and I wanted to be an astronaut from before I even remember. And so that's been the golden thread through my career in what would otherwise be quite a varied sort of all over the show career uh, path. Um, and I think that's probably my number one takeaway for today is that I think a straight career path or a linear uh, line of expertise is becoming more and more rare these days. And so for anybody on the call, I would say, uh, I would say that if you want, if you're interested in the aerospace sector, you don't need to be a deep technical expert. Our sectors need people from all sorts of different backgrounds, knowledge and experience. Um, so as Sophie mentioned, uh, I had a, a, I did physics with astrophysics. Um, and as much as I enjoyed it, uh, I, I wanted something with a bit more action. Uh, so I successfully applied to be air crew in the RAF. And uh, as we heard before, I can really relate to the, um, the challenges of needing a loo in a fast jet cockpit. Um, I recently found myself at the UK Space Agency, and I have to admit, I think this is where I've really, uh, I've never really looked back. Space has been and continues to be my absolute passion. Um, but I would also say that encouraging other people, whether it's men, women, from no matter what background they're in, is also one of my passions. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I tend to spend my days either emailing or talking to people, uh, teaching them about the benefits of space. Um, most people think of when they think of space, they think about astronauts, they think about satellites and rockets, but actually space gives us uh, huge benefits. It impacts parts of our daily lives, whether it be from providing the data for weather forecasting, whether it's getting from A to B using your, uh, your phone with GPS, um, or whether it's looking at the changes uh, uh, to the climate. Um, so I work across government to look at how we can uh, encourage the UK space sector and how we can benefit more from it. I thought a couple of memorable highlights might be interesting for the audience though. So um, in my time at the Space Agency, I, uh, I managed to represent the UK at the UN Space Committee. And I'm pleased to say that I didn't uh, create a diplomatic incident, success. Um, having dinner sat next to the NASA, the NASA chief scientist and talking, talking about his plans for exploring uh, gas giant planets and for exploring Mars and then being on a first uh, name basis with him. For my inner five-year-old, that was just so exciting. <laughs> um, and the last one would probably be knocking on the number 10 Downing Street door and walking in to go and meet with the Prime Minister's advisor um, on what we wanted to get from a National Space Council and what we would want to get from a National Space Strategy. Again, just a really surreal day. Um, I have to say I've opted out of, of 
putting forward one particular uh, inspirational woman because there's so many that I can think of, whether it be astronauts like Kathy Sullivan or Simonetta de Pippo, who heads up the UN Space uh, uh, Office, um, or even Raina Owens, who's in the Air Force, really leading the UK's military space uh, policy. But I think I've worked with so many people, um, in particular women, who inspire me every day. And they're the ones who, who face challenges, whether that be small failures, whether it's maybe an offhand comment that they've had that makes them question themselves just that little bit more than we already naturally do, but then they do it anyway. Um, and for me, working with those people and, and sharing the fact that, I think we all, but certainly I know I do, questions myself, I feel imposter syndrome and sometimes I think I really shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be at a table at the UN. I shouldn't be sat next to the NASA chief scientist and I shouldn't be knocking on the, the number door at number 10 Downing Street door, but I do it anyway. And so for me, I would say just do it anyway. Thank you. I so agree. Yes. Um, I mean, just, yeah, just do it. I, things like saying yes to being asked to, I was asked to give the Peter Nader Defence Lecture at Gresham College as the first woman ever to do it last year. And I just thought, ah, and then I went, yes. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. So it's brilliant advice, Nick, Nikki. Um, okay, turning now to uh, Air Commodore Soraya Marshall. Soraya joined the RAF as a navigator in 1994. She spent three years. Um, three tours, sorry, flying on the Tornado F3, serving on many operational deployments and qualified as a weapons instructor. She's commanded 92 Squadron in the Air Warfare Centre, 55 Squadron, which delivers rear crew flying training and was deputy commander of the RAF's I Star Force. In 2019, she worked as the director of coalition, coalition air operations in the Middle East, Afghanistan and beyond. Her staff appointments have spanned defence procurement and the Joint Strategic Environment, most recently as military assistant to the Vice Chief of Defence Staff. And she assumed command of her current role, um, Command of RAF College Cranwell, as its Commandant in December 2019. Really lovely to have you here, Soraya. Over to you. Thanks, Sophie. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be with you all. Um, OK, so I'm going to you know, cover the same set of questions, really, what drew me into flying uh, what does my day job consist of and um, role models um, so I was a very I was a real latecomer to flying I had no background in it um, I uh, didn't really know anything about the Air Force I wasn't part of the cadets um, and I really sort of uh, stumbled into it whilst I was at university I'd always naggingly wanted to sort of learn how to fly I have no idea why um, probably because I thought it was relatively exciting. Uh, maybe it's because Top Gun was released when I was a child and that had some subliminal influence on me. Um, but I ended up joining the University Air Squadron um, in my second year and absolutely loved it. Learned how to fly. Um, I found it challenging, um, exciting, fun. Um, it takes skill, both sort of physical dexterity, but also sort of mental agility. And it's something that you really want to sort of master. Um, and so when I graduated, I decided to join the RAF because I love flying, um, because I felt really at home um, in, in the RAF. Uh, and I also realised that I didn't quite want an office job um, at that point in my career. But actually, if I look back to that time, you know, in 1992, that's when the policy changed and uh, women were allowed to fly combat aircraft. And I think that sense of equality actually really, really appealed. Um, this idea that there were no artificial barriers, um, you know, the Air Force is absolutely a meritocracy um, and if you are good enough, you will succeed. Um, and I also, um, in reflecting backwards, you know, I grew up in the era of Margaret Thatcher and like her or loathe her as a, a woman. Um, she was nonetheless, uh, sorry, as a politician, she was nonetheless a woman at the very uh, top of her uh, career and, and arguably the sort of top job in the country. Um, and I think actually as a young woman embarking on my career, I found that pretty empowering. It sort of showed that anything was possible. Um, and so as I joined the Air Force, even as one of the very first few women to do it, um, I think I genuinely wasn't daunted or put off by that prospect. And it seemed the sort of natural choice of career for me. So what does my day job consist of then? Um, 
I don't really think there is any such thing as a normal uh, day. And in my career of almost 30 years, um, it has been so utterly varied. And actually, that's one of the things I really love about being in the RAF. Um, the first sort of 10, 15 years was absolutely all about flying, you know, establishing those professional credentials, mastering your operational art, sort of understanding air power. Uh, and I realised probably listening to Gemma being mildly dehydrated and trying desperately not to need the loo whilst I was in the cockpit. Um, and of course, as you get more promoted, uh, sorry, more senior and promoted in, in, in the RAF, you, you absolutely build on all of that knowledge that you've, you've acquired, but you move more into leadership roles and you work in other aspects, sort of more broader aspects of what uh, the RAF delivers and of course, defence. In terms of role models then, I think being one of the first few women, I don't have sort of an individual role model, certainly not within my career field. Um, this concept of seeing it to be it simply didn't exist because there weren't any. Uh, and of course, for me at the time when I joined, as I said, because I wasn't daunted by that prospect, I don't think it was necessary, necessarily a problem for me. Uh, of course, Jo Salter, who you'll be hearing from next, uh, she was a few years ahead of me and she was absolutely a role model to uh, all of us who, who followed after her being the first woman to qualify on jets. Um, but actually, a lot of the inspiration I got were from people I admired, um, you know, further on in their careers. Uh, and for me, they were mainly men. Um, and, and I think that's OK. Um, but in my sort of 30 years of experience, I recognise that that's not true for, for many people. Uh, and if you look at the percentage of women who, who uh, are flying, you know, now to almost 30 years ago, it hasn't changed kind of as much as we hoped it would. Uh, and so I recognise, I think, the importance of, of role models um, is absolutely huge. Um, when I was younger, I sort of shied away from that role. Um, I, I think I was a bit embarrassed by it. I didn't think that I had the credibility for it. Uh, but as I've become more senior, um, I absolutely recognise the importance of it and the responsibility uh, of, of being and the positive influence that you can have um, on others. And that's really, really significant. Uh, and on that note, I think I'll hand over to my first role model, Joe Salter. Yeah, you've practically done Joe's introduction for me, Soraya. Thanks so much for that. Um, so, yeah, I'm really delighted uh, that our next panellist, Joe, uh, was Britain's first female fast jet pilot. Uh, during 12 years full time service, her appointments included flying the Tornado GR1 on the front line with 617 Squadron teaching junior fast jet pilots as a qualified tactics instructor and working in defence intelligence during the Yugoslav crisis. Outside the RAF, Jo's built a very varied career, running her own management consultancy, lecturing for the OU Business School, working as an inspirational speaker, and I've heard her speak and she is very inspirational, and writing. She's currently a director in risk at PwC, and uh, to add to that, she's also an honorary group captain in 601 Squadron. And importantly, in this context, she's joining us as an aviation ambassador for the Department for Transport. Lovely to have you here, Joe. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Sophie. Um, and it, it's interesting um, listening to all of this. I've, been, I've had this massive grin on my face. And I, I suppose, yes, I sit here with a number of those different hats. Um, and if we take that first one as an ex fast jet pilot flying the tornado, GL1 and Gemma, that definitely means, like, like Nikki had said as well, I can talk firsthand about those challenges of needing to wee whilst airborne and definitely the associated behavioural changes that come with it. Um, and yes, then that, that second hat, um, which is along with that 12 years of full-time service, I've done 14 years of reservist, um, the first 10 years flying air cadets and um, giving them air experience flights and, and currently on 601 Squadron. And then that third and final hat um, being an aviation ambassador for the Department of Transport. And I'm also a member of our staff diversity council in my day job. And that's so important to mention because I absolutely believe fundamentally that having diversity and inclusion embedded within our culture leads to better outcomes. Um, and this of course has been evidenced by numerous um, studies. And I, I think I think it brings a creative tension to the way we work as well as avoiding groupthink. And when I think about air and space particularly, it's critical that our people represent society, um, but also embracing better outcomes in such a safety critical environment is absolutely paramount. 
and I have really championed diversity, as Soraya was saying, in, in many ways. And human performance is one that I'm absolutely passionate about because it, not only is it the right thing to do, because flying is actually just a brain operating a machine, but it also provides a much bigger pool for us to get our talent from. Um, because fundamentally, a lack of talent and a lack of diversity and inclusion leads to issues of both fairness and, and unhappiness. People become un unhappy. And the impact of this has ripple effects that causes so many people a significant amount of time and energy. Just imagine a world where these issues didn't exist. So people can focus on being amazing at what they do at their job and looking after their own well-being rather than spending time on, on inequality in the workplace. So as well as being a female engineer, I've, yes, that first-hand experience of being a minority when I first joined and, and became Britain's first female fast jet pilot. And I'll be honest, there were times of both overt and covert forms of discrimination. And sometimes they're just jokes, but sometimes the fifth joke or the sixth or the tenth or the fiftieth isn't funny. And I've always been someone to speak up and speak out and be quite direct. Um, but actually, this became part of my formative experience in the workplace. And it's inspired that lifelong passion for and commitment for me to help others in equality, diversity, and most importantly, inclusion. Now, <laughs> I hate to say that I learned to fly 30 years ago and things have changed significantly. Um, but honestly, it's not enough. So when I put my aviation ambassador hat on, I have the opportunity to promote diversity and inclusion in the aviation sector where there are significant diversity issues. And, and I don't mean just in gender, when we think about age or other underrepresented groups. Um, I was looking and, and I checked the stats today, hoping that the last time I had looked at this statistic, it would have changed, but it hadn't. So still today, according to the International Society of Women Airline Pilots, 5% are female. Let me just say that again, 5%. Now, I completed my airline transport pilot's license um, quite a few years ago now, um, but there were so many barriers and so much cost to finding a job that I decided to follow a different route. So how can we make sure that we're making opportunities for people to use their talent and not losing them to different industries. And I've got one final point that I wanted to raise, which is about design. Again, when I go back to my 20s when I started flying, one of the arguments about not being allowed to is that women didn't fit. But of course we didn't when the design had been around the average man, not the average human being. And so we need to be making sure that today when we innovate, when we're introducing new products, when we design air and spacecraft and the relevant equipment to support it, that we're taking the whole of the human race into account, not just a proportion of it. Now, um, I want to know where I sign up for the space programme, actually. That's my next thing. Thank you, Sophie. I'll give it back to you. Cheers. Thank you so much, Jo. Uh, and I couldn't, couldn't support what you're saying more. It's, and you, you do do so much. So thank you okay moving on to our final panelists before we go to questions uh, we've got a few questions in the q a but please do um do pile in on pile in there uh, with your questions for the panel if you want to ask something specific to one member of the panel that's fine or or perhaps a more general one but first i'm delighted uh, to introduce catherine bennett she's senior vice president and airbus and leads the company's external engagement and strategy in the uk she was awarded the obe in January 2019 for services to the aerospace and aviation sector. In July 2018, Catherine founded the UK's Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter, which we've become a signatory to today, the Freeman Institute, and which you've heard a bit about, committed to building a fair and balanced industry for women in this sector. And thank you for doing that, Catherine. She's also on the board of the International Aviation Women's Association. And Catherine is on the move soon, so she's just about to join the high value manufacturing catapult, which I can't say without stumbling over it. So, so sorry, as it's CEO very soon. Catherine, thanks for taking time. I know everything must be very busy at the moment, but it's great to have you here. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. 
Um, so the last time I did one of these events, the, the Prince of Wales had done a speech quite recently about the environment and he said he acknowledged he was quite well known for banging on about the environment. And I realise now that over the last few years, I also have a reputation for banging on about diversity, gender diversity and aerospace, aviation and defence, of course. Um, and I realised that rather than have typical, perhaps British reticence, I really needed to see it to be it, as you've used, Sophie, in your title of our conference today. Um, so, uh, as others have said, uh, Sophie wanted us to talk about what drew me to the sector. Um, again, my re re recognition and remembrance is a little bit hazy, uh, but all I can remember, I've been at Airbus now for 16 years, um, the topic of diversity was not really a big issue, which obviously showed the time the era I was in. I, before joining aerospace, I worked in automotive. So you could say two industrial sectors that certainly needs to improve its gender balance. I do remember when I worked in the car industry that we had a female plant director and she, you know, she did not want to be seen as a role model. She quite adamantly said to us who were working with her, she did not want to do Radio 4 Women's Hour. She didn't want to be featured as a woman. And I remember at the time, I really disagreed with that. And perhaps as Soraya said, uh, you know, I, earlier, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a role model either, but I knew that it was wrong when a senior person like that didn't speak up. So perhaps that has encouraged me. Um, I'm not an engineer, um, I'm not really a technical expert, but as I was pleased to hear Nicola say earlier, in our sector, you don't have to be a technical, technical expert. But what I am is a huge enthusiast for innovation. Um, I love learning and working alongside innovators. Um, ingenuity is such a great word. But I knew that perhaps my advocacy and communication skills could help me talk about the sector. So. Just briefly, if I may say a few words about aviation, um, in the good times, perhaps before this awful pandemic, um, our sector was contributed 52 billion pounds to the UK GDP. That's 3.4% of the economy. Um, Airbus alone, we spend five billion pounds on UK suppliers, including over 1,200 SMEs. So our importance to the UK, you know, I'm happy to bang on about that too. Partnerships are really important to us. Um, just before the pandemic started, I had the honour of visiting RAF Shawbury to see the work um, that Airbus helicopters do there with the MFTS um, guys. And that was incredible to see that. And uh, pleased to see Mike Wigston was there presenting the, the prizes to the graduates there. The other important thing for me in terms of our sector is to talk about skills and training. Over 4,000 people over the last decade have gone through Airbus's early career scheme and a thousand apprentices in the last decade, which is incredible. And I'm so delighted that Airbus and other parts of aerospace and defence have continued with their apprentice schemes throughout this pandemic because it can be all too easy to make decisions. And just in terms of uh, working in aerospace as a female i can't match Gemma and nicola's comments about needing the loo in a jet fast jet but i do have a story about once taking some vips around our factory in north wales and we could not find the ladies loo anywhere and in fact when we did find it it was locked and nobody knew the code number for the padlock so there's there's issues in in industry as well but uh, some interesting discussions to have there but as Sophie said, uh, in terms of what I do at Airbus at the moment, I'm uh, the lead external facing executive. Um, so I have the honour of participating in panels like this, but also dealing with the government and other industry leaders, ensuring that uh, Airbus's relationships are maintained. My office is literally across the road from King's, so it's wonderful to be part of this session today. As Sophie also said, yes, I uh, was one of the founders of the Women in Aviation and Aerospace Charter. I'm absolutely delighted Victoria was, was with us today. The charter was launched in, at the Farnborough Air Show in 2018, and we only had about 20 to 30 signatories. And as Victoria said, we've now got 230. Um, and it was incredible. I just knew it was the right thing to be doing when I didn't really have to push the door very hard at certain airlines and airports and other industrial companies. They all felt it was the right thing to do. 
And then I was also delighted back in September 2019, the Women in Defence organisation launched a Women in Defence Charter as well. So the, the pattern was established. I also serve on the board of the International Aviation Women's Association. I've done that for the last six years. That's been incredible in terms of the networking. So I would really encourage people to get as involved as they can in organisations such as that. For me, the contacts and the friends I've made around the world. Um, I've got lots of really good friends at Boeing. You know, we don't worry about comp competition matters there because we're all focused on promoting gender diversity. And one of the things I'm, I'm really proud about that Iowa do is uh, sponsorships and scholarships for young women wanting to go into aerospace and aviation. Um, of course, um, one of the most important things is to measure. So the Women in Aviation UK Charter has done some studies recently, as Victoria mentioned, but also Iowa did a global study. And this is where we got those figures about the airline pilots that Joe was just mentioning. Yeah, five to six percent of airline pilots and only 1800 captains um, are women. So we've got a lot of work to do there. In terms of industry as well, there's only 3% of female CEOs in, in the aerospace and defence uh, industry. Um, and you know, that compares really badly to other industrial sectors where the figure is usually 19%. So still a lot of work to be done. But in terms of business and in industry, um, I, I, I've got a quote here. I, forgive me, Joe, it's not from PwC, but it's from Boston Consulting Group. Uh, and they came up with some figures recently. It says that firms with more diverse teams had off operating profit margins at least 9% higher. So that's if they had diverse teams, the, the profits are higher, which of course is the way business is measured. Um, and I think we need to remember that and use that as an argument. Uh, as Sophie also said, I'm moving next month to become CEO of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult which I'm hugely honoured to be doing. I'm going to be sitting around a table with seven male CEOs, so wish me luck, everybody. Um, but I've so far had a very warm welcome and I know they're you know, looking forward to, uh, to the challenges with that role and I hope that I can keep in touch with all of you. So my final comment um, is just a bit of reflection that I read recently. And I use this a lot in work, uh, whether it's on gender diversity topics or just leadership topics, which meant a lot to me, which is you can persuade with reason, but you motivate with emotion. And that goes back to what I was talking about. I really see the need to continue to bang on about this, but also to be a role model. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Catherine. And apparently I have I am not very visible, so I am going to share with you my not very um, attractive uh, normal background, and hopefully this will solve the problem. Um, can anybody see me? No. Fine. Well, I can host the Q and A. You don't have to see my face. Um, you might want to put on the other panelists, Abby, maybe. Um, I'm going to crack on with the questions and answers. Um, uh, and I, I'll start with a couple that are aimed directly uh, at, um, at specific people. And Julia, I'm going to come to you first. A couple, two questions. One from Jason Wilkes. For Julia, what what was it in January that attracted you to the space industry from from a ballerina? my daughter could be following in your footsteps. And secondly, um, Daria Balkina uh, from Kazakhstan, I think, what's the path for a PhD in space? Now, clearly there must be loads and loads of answers to that, um, but uh, I'll let you, let you try and have a go at both of those. Yeah, great. I mean, I'll try to keep this as concise as possible, but um, it's interesting. The first person that I met when I joined FASI was uh, Wing Commander Cliff Fletcher Jones, who was also in ballet as his background. Uh, and he studied ballet and then ended up doing masters in the RAF, and now he's studying space power. So there's this weird consistency with ballerinas and space power now, which I can't, I don't understand, but uh, it's definitely there. But um, yeah, even your son could be following in those footsteps. But, you know, I think, God, what attracted me to the space industry is Art's consistent across foreign relations. Uh, it's used as a tool as well. And, uh, you know, I could cite Sun Tzu Art of War, but it's the, it's the way that we look at things that are really informative. And 
I don't, I don't think that it diverges too far off the path, even though it seems like, you know, dancing on stage to sitting on a panel. It is a performance, both of them, but, you know, you have to sort of, you channel them in different, in different ways. Um, and as for a path for a PhD in space, I tried to touch on this, but there really is no singular path. Um, I just say maybe honing in on your own expertise and finding a topic that you're passionate enough to not want to kill after three years, maybe. Um, but yeah, I'd look at I'd look at the Freeman Air and Space Institute for opportunities. I'd look at Leicester um, because they've been posting some uh, studentships as well. But um, for a path and PhD, there's really nothing that I can say that's consistent. But get a master's, find somebody that you would like to have as your dissertation supervisor, maybe in your field. Um, go to conferences, listen to people speak, ask them for coffees. I was really inspired by um, Alexandra Stickings when I saw her in a few conferences and I met her for coffee and she gave me a really great advice about how to get into the industry and just she also had a diverse path and it was really inspiring. So I think that's what I would say. Not It's not concrete but find your own path basically is what I would recommend. Thank, thanks so much. Um, I, I'm going to um, Go to Gemma with it's another question from Jason. Um, uh, and uh, uh, she, he, she, he says, Great investigation. How does military flying compare to civil airlines for gender balance? Is the need to use an appropriate to toilet key to the difference? And it may be that other panelists have, have a view on the difference between the two, um, the two as well as, as, as Gemma. But I'll start with you, Gemma. Go on. Go for it. Uh, thanks, Jason, for the question. Um, it's a really interesting trend, and it's been touched on a couple of times in, in the last few uh, presentations. So UK average is about 5%, global average is 6%, and the country that's storming ahead is India, um, and they have over 13% um, of their female pilots are women. Um, but they've come at this decision much later, um, so they've come with a very inclusive mindset and tried to design in things like childcare and routing to just make it as inclusive as possible. And then they've also had some really interesting some things like um, a public relations campaign that's included a Netflix film that's absolutely enchanting um, about the uh, you know the the daughters of India uh, you know now coming into the aviation world to get families involved in promoting it as a um, as a career opportunity um, for their for their daughters and for women so sort of accepting it more um, because as I said in my bit there is so many factors involved in um, the, the barriers and you know, Joe went through a few as well so uh, there's no simple solution and the toilet certainly isn't uh, you know the absolute if we sort that we'll have women uh, you know knocking at the door but what it is is a, a really useful vehicle as I said to just get people talking and thinking about it in a really different way as to you know what might be hidden and what might also be out there um, because you can have a really great diverse policy but if you're not actually inclusive if you don't make your teammates feel like they're valued respected for who they are and what they bring to the team then you're not going to have a team that thrives and brings you those great economic returns that Catherine talks about so that's really sort of the goal behind this is uh, you know, something that gets people talking uh, and I think nearly everybody's mentioned the toilets so I've obviously got uh, you know interesting <laughs> thoughts going on today but um, that, that's my thoughts on, on where we are with that. <laughs> Thanks Gemma yeah in fact I was just remembering at air power conferences in the late 90s there were only, or no, the 2000s, there were only ever Caroline Wyatt, who was a defence correspondent, and one other woman, and maybe Catherine in the, in the ladies. It was, the, it was the only time we had a quiet one. Um, jo, I know you wanted to come in, so over to you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to tell a very short story, really, back in the day when I first arrived on the squadron. And of course, there was only one set of toilets, and um, there were only men and me. I could see Soraya smiling already and remembering it well, and Nikki. And um, the safety equippers made a velcro sticker that said it had like a little women or men and so you just put up on the velcro as to whether it was and i often laugh and think we we don't have well i don't have i don't know about anybody else two sets of toilets at home i share with the male member of my family quite easily and it's funny that um and again things are moving and changing but it was such a big thing but i always remember work, walking for a four ship when I would run to get there first because otherwise I'd be delayed and I'd make it a ladies and I'd say sorry guys it's a ladies and they'd all say sorry Joe, we're coming in and it we just all got on with it it was a very straightforward simple thing thanks thanks for that Joe. I'm going to move on to a question from Demos Space UK um, and um, uh, maybe just ask to Nicola first but I'm sure there's others that might want to come in I hear a lot of discussions about diversity and inclusion aimed at women, and this is great. 
but so few initiatives are targeted at very young girls. Do you think we can change the statistics without addressing the fundamental issues still facing girls um, about hearing messages about how hard it can be for women in STEM? And before I could turn to look, I would say there's one thing we particularly wanted to do in this, um, in this event today was talk about the really great work, research, interesting career paths um, and achievements of women like all our panellists, rather than focus on how hard it can be. We, we, we've discussed that too, and we're very happy to answer questions, but I, I, I just want to reinforce that with all of you, um, that we thought long and hard about that when we were, we were planning this event to make sure that we, we didn't pr pr just predominantly talk about the difficulties. But um, Nicola, do you want to have a um, talk a little bit about the STEM side of things and young, younger people? Yeah, so um, I know in the space agency, we've got uh, a real focus on skills and outreach. And that, that stems from a very young age all the way up to university graduates and beyond. Um, so we, we go into schools and we take a space suit and we'll talk to them and we use uh, the inspirational nature and, and how exciting space is to encourage uh, a passion and excitement early on. Um, and I know I've seen a message from Kathy Bowden on the chat and she is our uh, one of our outreach uh, leads. So she will definitely know more than I do about if you uh, have any questions about the specifics. But I think as a personal reflection, um, I think there's only so far that outreach programs can go. Um, and I think it really boils down to the people that you trust around you, so your family, uh, your teachers. I remember uh, having a male science teacher who I told I want I want to be an astronaut, and he was like, "But you're you're from Stockport, <laughs> which is south of Manchester, and it's not the most affluent area." And I was like, "Well, what's what does that have to do with it? I don't understand." And so it's little comments like that from people that are trusted and influential on your life at that time, I think are really, really important. And going back to the ballerina versus space, <laughs> I would say that they are not mutually exclusive. You can, you can be a brilliant ballerina and you can be a brilliant space policy PhD leader of your time, at, you know, simultaneously. So I think, um, I think it's, about just challenging some of those ideas that it's one or the other you can be a brilliant intelligent princess thanks nikki um i i know i know joe wanted to come in and i'm going to go to joe but i'm also going to pose another question um which i think others might want to answer as well but joe might have a comment um from an anonymous attendee i'm all for championing championing Championing, I can't say it, young people and supporting them. But I wonder if more needs to be done for returners to the aviation industry. So I left the military serving as an engineer, I left to have a baby, but I've been out of the industry so long, I know I cannot return. Is there a way to support women being able to return to the industry later in life? So, Joe, if you want to cover the point about young girls and then maybe segue into that point, and if there's anybody else um, who wants to answer that second question, then please do. Absolutely. And for some reason, my computer put me in the dark when we mentioned the returners. Um, I've no idea why, because it hasn't suddenly got dark here in South London. And I think it's, it's fascinating because when you look at coding clubs and you see young people who are seven, eight, nine years old, there is no gender difference and they love it. But something happens when um, they get to teenage, teenage years. And, and honestly, I think it boils down to our curriculum, the way we teach. Um, STEM is exciting. Everything, when we talk about aviation and space, it's the most exciting, fascinating thing. Again, irrelevant of gender, but we need to put it across in a way that engages. And I think that, um, I, I know that there is a qualification at uh, 16 to 18 being designed at the moment for space and aviation. Um, in terms of DFT, part of the outreach that we're doing, notwithstanding what Nikki said, is that outreach only usually gets to the people who want to be reached. So again, how do we broaden the span and engage people um, with becoming brilliant engineers and uh, in the United Kingdom to take us forward? Because that's what we need to do. As for, that is my bugbear about, we have these amazing people who do so well and they also are amazing and have children. And yet it's difficult to get a job afterwards. How do you return? And 
Um, I've been incredibly impressed what the Air Force have done to improve that, because certainly if you wanted to go back into the Air Force, it's much easier than it was back in the day. However, um, I do think that, you know, some organisations may have programmes, but I don't know how much happens in um, space and aviation. Soraya probably knows something on that, though, in your role. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm just to, just to back up. It's such an important point. I think the societal norms element of it. I mean, everybody here on this panel, um, you know, embodies how, you know, what a great career you can have in, in, in air and space and aviation. And I, and I, you know, I think we will all, um, you know, be able to talk about what an exciting, challenging, rewarding career it's been. I've got so many friends who are so envious, the female friends who are so envious of, of the job that I've had. And yet, you know, in my younger years, I was sort of slightly embarrassed almost, you know, outside of RAF circles to talk about what I did. I hated it. Whereas, you know, the guy next to me would go, yeah, I'm a pilot, I fly jets. You know, it was, it was kind of cool. We haven't quite hit that formula to make it cool for women to do this job yet. Um, and I think challenging those societal norms is such an important thing to do. And, and which is why the seeing it to be it is so important because I think until we see women do it, until the teachers in the schools can start saying, do you know what, you could do this, you could, because they don't understand that it can be done, that it is a good career path. We won't ever start making inroads into those sort of perceptions and, and misconceptions about what those careers are. Um, and, 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 you know, again, you know, when my, in my younger years, I was a firm believer in equality, that's it, doesn't matter who you are, it's just whether you're good enough to do the job. Now that's a sort of, it, it, that's the nirvana, that's where we should be heading towards. Uh, but it's slightly naive, I think, if, if we want to wait for 100 years for that to just kind of slowly evolve, then, then great. But if we want to make it happen more quickly, then positive action, you know, bring these women back, you've got the talent that we've invested in, to make sure that they can be those positive role models is so important. Thanks, Soraya. I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Yeah, I think just to, to back up the um, point made just now is that actually there's people that industry are looking for who have skills that wouldn't normally be a route into our sector. So just talked about coding, uh, people who are brilliant at maths, um, all kinds of knowledge about digital. Um, these are the kind of skill sets that people need now. So when Airbus and I know Rolls Royce and other companies go into schools, that's one of the things we talk about is the whole different kind of scope of skill sets that you need. And that really does work. Another thing that works really well, um, you know, a lot of our graduates and apprentices go into the schools and we may always make sure that we have good diverse groups who go in um, and, and they, they, they're intrigued, the school children are intrigued, not only about the role of an engineer, but actually what it's like working in a big organisation, such as an international company like Airbus. So we had a French female engineer who used to go in and the school kids in Bristol just loved it because she would talk to them all about France and speak about different languages and different cultures. So there's a whole lot of different things you can do. But, but going to the point about returners, absolutely um, not to you know, talk too much to, to these wonderful RAF people I'm looking at on the screen now, but military personnel have such great worth ethic. You're always on time. You're very smartly turned out, you know exactly what you're doing, very impressive and professional. So I would encourage military personnel to look into industry, and I know you do, um, but you know, the companies like mine are always looking for people, good people, and um, personally, I know Airbus are happy to, to look at returners. Um, I've literally just recruited somebody from the aerospace sector to come and work for me in my new job. So um, there's a lot of transfer, but maybe we used to need to use our networks a bit more and help each other. Yeah, thank you. I totally agree. Um, I, uh, for those of you who are watching, um, even if you're not putting a question on yourself, do have a read because some people are posting some links that you might be interested in. And I just wanted to comment on um, something from Cathy Bowden. It's the responsibility of each one of us to get out as STEM ambassadors and role models into schools and informal learning environments, brownies, etc. help with their space badges. I was in my former life when I was in the Royal Air Force, I was OC operations wing at RAF Valley in Anglesey, but I was also, I had a second role as um, Sparkly Owl in, in the, local, um, the local brownies, and which was a good break from work uh, one, one evening a week. The, the so these these were local kids, mainly children of, of of sort of the local area 
and although they had a something great airfield right beside them until we we started talking about a badge and it was to do with aviation that the girl most of the girls were really surprised they could be pilots but of course they were beside an airfield where there really weren't very many women well there were no women pilots on fast jets either instructors or students for the entire time i was there and this was in 20 2009 10 and only a you know, a couple of women on the helicopter side. So I totally agree, you know, that things like brownies do get those conversations going and, and um, it's really important. Um, moving up, uh, I, there's a couple of questions about expanding diversity. I'm going to put them together and see if, um, see who, who would like to, to perhaps address them. Um, Jamie says there seems to be emphasis on expanding diversity among pilots. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, by by um, extension, you, you probably imply air crew as well, since we've got a couple of um, weapon support um, systems operators, ex weapon systems operators. I'd be interested in your thoughts on inclusion among the many other career fields in aviation, maintenance, logistics, airfield operations, security, etc. So that's one question. And then I think another: um, Do you believe there are enough initiatives for women of colour? in this area? I think that's an excellent question. I think I'm, I'm sure the answer for most of us would be definitely not, but I'd be interested to know if any of my panellists want to make any comments on those questions. Uh, go on, Jo. Were you going? I was going to say, you know that I'm always happy to speak, so I do try and hold myself back sometimes I'm on my best behaviour, Sophie. I think um, that last one first, you know, we'll just look at this panel, you know, there, are, there is nobody of colour in this panel. And actually, that's a travesty that we're having that. And, um, and I think it's really important that we understand that inclusion means taking action and talking about it and doing something about it to change that status quo to the position that we want. And to drive that to happen means that we have to work really hard at doing so, and we all have to do it. And um, I don't know what the, the answer is, but certainly we need to be committed to it. Um, going back to the, the first part of the question, which um, which I've now completely forgotten and gone. So someone tell me what the first part was. It was the other branches and the other yeah. sort of areas of aviation. I sort of think that we talk about the 5% because it's so shocking. I think that other parts of aviation, but I, I haven't got the statistics in front of me. So again, I don't know whether Catherine, you've got these. Um, they certainly aren't as badly represented. They're still badly represented. Um, they all, I mean, I remember going to speak to at Unilever once and they were telling me about in their senior management that they had 47% women and 53% men. And I said, that is amazing. And they looked at me and they said, no, it's not because it's not 50%. And where why aren't we driving at achieving 50 percent not 30 percent not 20 percent we need to really drive forward in absolutely every way and we've just got to get behind it thanks i totally agree sorry was sorry were you going to come in yeah no just completely agree i mean diversity it's, it doesn't matter what sort of branch you're in in the air force or what what aspect it, it's it's across the board i mean it, it, an organization benefits from greater diversity diversity um, you tap into you know stronger you know better talent pools if you can get into those black asian and, and ethnic minorities it, i mean it, it's kind of a no-brainer um i think as a strategy and it's certainly what what, what the air force is is driving very very hard for um and, and our youth and stem programs it's getting into the schools it's trying to change the mindset trying to change the perceptions trying to get into the communities try exactly as they have done i love that sort of indian um you know civil airline um you know trying to make it the families believe it's a great job and a great career so they push their children in that direction this is absolutely the sort of thing that we need to be doing um, I'm, I'm mindful of time and um we're running up against the end of the event which is 1715 so I think we're going to have to wrap it up there. I, I, this has been a great discussion. And there are so many great questions and actually really interesting comments um, in the Q&A. So I, I um, do recommend um, ha having a quick read of them. There are some about, um, just to cover, to, 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 to go back to that point about women of color. Our intention in Freeman is, is to do more on diversity and inclusion that's women, people of color, you know, we, we don't, we, it, we, we, this is a focus for our first event and we will do more events um, 
uh, directly about uh, women in the, and air and space power, but there will be other diversity events as well. And, and another thing that people are asking about whether, um, you know, there could be more of a, a, a community around this discussion. I, I can't answer you directly on that at the moment, but what I would say is um, if the Freeman Air and Space Institute website, which clearly if you're here, you've managed to find at some point, um, do go on there, you can sign up to our mailing list and there is also an email address on there. So if you have any suggestions or ideas and want to get in touch with us, then I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Uh, so can I thank my panellists um, for a very, very rich and, and inspiring discussion. I think you know, what was it Jo said? She had a massive grin on her face. And then one of the other comments said um, from Claire Baker, said she was grinning from ear to ear. And I think that that is a really great. Yes, we've talked about some really challenging issues and some really quite, you know, poor statistics, but there are these amazing women here that are absolutely there so that um, others people can see, can see that they are and see it to be it. I'm delighted that we're being joined by um, Chief of the Air Staff, uh, Air Chief Marshal, Sir Mike Wigston. He's uh, he, you know, done some incredible work on diversity and inclusion. I know he's passionate about it because as soon as he heard we were doing this event, he said, please could he join and please could he take part. So I'm absolutely delighted uh, to introduce him. Uh, Chief of the Air Staff, many of you know he, he won't need introduction, but for those of you who don't, uh, over to you, Sir Mike. Sophie, thanks ever so much. And, and thank you to all of the, the brilliant uh, panellists this afternoon. You, you, you said the word in, inspiring. Some of the stories we've heard, some of the examples and, and you know, so, some of the so sobering stories as well, which, which highlights the importance of, of having this discussion and, and sharing this discussion. So some of you will know that I actually joined the Air Force over 30 years ago now with Joe Salter. And we went through the first part of our of our career together and and joe absolutely was a a trailblazer a trailblazing woman going through uh fast jet pilot training all the way to the to the front line and and at the time there were a lot of women coming through and i and i and i i, I look now at the senior leadership in the royal air force and i and i ask where where is joe salter where are all of the other women who joined over 30 years ago and why why is uh why is soraya the only air crew um, Air Commodore, uh, who, who's, a, who's a woman. And, and, and that, that's not just an aircrew issue, actually, everywhere you look across the Air Force, we've, we've got a, an unlevel playing field, whether it's the amount of time that women stay in the service, the, the tapering of, uh, of the rank structure as you work, up, work your way up through the rank structure, e even things like um, honours and awards, it's not a level playing field. And there are a number of reasons for that, and there's a number of reasons why you um you know that have the surfaced today and 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 they they include everything from the institutional uh constraints that that because it's an organization that's de designed by men and equipped by men all, all the way through to the the cultures and behaviors there's an element of confidence i think and and role models and the part that role models play in confidence there's an element of networking and that's why uh, women in defense and the women in aviation and aerospace grouping is so important in, in creating these networks and there is an element around around parenthood and and motherhood uh, in particular and and all of these things uh, well if, if, if you can't do something about them or, or can't attempt to do something about them when you're chief of the air staff then then uh, then then uh, you, you've got to have a pretty good reason why not and so these are all things that I'm determined to get after as uh, as chief and um, whilst none of them are easy they're all achievable and and there are all things that we are moving forward on whether it's flexible service around parent parenting for men and, and flexible service for parenting for men and women and making that culturally acceptable whether it's around cultures and behaviors whether it's around rejoiners and bringing people back in those are all things that we're we're getting after and bit by bit we're moving the dial because the numbers uh, are, 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 are far from good. We've got a long way to go both on gender and ethnic diversity and we've got a, a lot of things to change. So, so in, in that note, there is work to be done. There's a lot to be talked about and, and uh, I was delighted and really interested to hear everything that, uh, that everybody had to say. And all I would say to you is just keep that conversation going and, and let's just keep moving the dial and, and moving this moving this forward.
and and on that on that final note and on that rejoining note i would just say that the royal air force is recruiting and uh, and if any of you are interested um then uh, you know where to find me sophie thank you very much thank you so much sir michael it's a delight delighted to have you with us um and you know you are you are setting the standard in giving the raf really ambitious targets for uh, recruitment for 2030 and i really uh, admire and appreciate that so it's it's for me with we're a minute away from the end of the event to just really say thank you particularly obviously to the many many of you who joined us in the audience um for your comments and questions and and suggestions uh in the q a area for how people could to get involved with the different uh organizations and different activities uh, then of course uh, the women in aviation and aerospace charter victoria for joining us uh, and i'm looking forward to uh, our relationship going forward with the freeman air and space institute and finally our fantastic speakers um panelists as i say you know there's a grinning from ear to ear is one of the nicest things i've had put in the chat box for an event and you know it, it, it's inspirational to hear from you all. I, I you know, I, I've spoken to you all and know you all, some of you I've known for 30 years or so, uh, but it's just great to have you here. You are, and this is a message I really want to get across, the tip of a large and growing iceberg. There are so many women in the air and space sector now, not enough by any means, but actually we, we could have run an event with, with, you know, scores and scores of people. So you've been brilliant and I hope you won't mind me in saying that you're also representative of a whole lot more women that are out there that we know are doing really impressive work. So thank you uh, and, and thank you of course to Chief of the Air Staff for his final comments and I am going to draw a close there. Uh, I just want to mention that we have a next event on the Integrated Review in conversation with Air Chief Marshal uh, and Andrew Turner who's Deputy Commander Capability for the Air Force. He's going to be reflecting on the integrated review. And I understand that you can sign up on our website right now. So if you're ringing off in a second, you could just go straight to the website and do that. Uh, and yeah, as I say, please keep involved with us and we will be running more events, hopefully in person uh, with you later in the year. Very many thanks. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>